Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. My name is Burns, and I'm an alcoholic. I appreciate uh, y'all asking me to come, and let me clear up something before I start. I, I'm a little nervous today. Now, I, 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 do a, I travel and do a lot of speaking. I've cut back on it in the last five or six years uh, for a lot of reasons, but I uh, almost never get nervous, but I'm a little nervous today. And I was asking myself as I was sitting there listening to y'all talk why I was a little bit nervous, and I realized this is the first time that I've ever spoken before a group that speaks a different language from me. <laughs> and so what I've done is I've asked, I, I was going to ask Kevin to interpret for me, but after listening to him talk here, I, I don't think that'll work. <laughs> so I'm going to ask Bud to interpret for me because he still speaks my language. Now, it's, it's bad enough to be from the United States, but I'm from Kentucky, and that makes a huge difference, even if you're in the United States, if you're from Kentucky. And the only way I know that I'm close to home is when we say the Lord's Prayer at the end, we finish at the same time. And in many places, that's not true. <laughs> You've asked me to come and share with you my experience, strength, and hope, and uh, what I was like, what happened, and what I'm like today. Uh, that's an evolution, as most of you know, who are in recovery. Uh, if you hear me speak today, and I'm still staying pure with the program of Alcoholics Anonymous, as I know it. Uh, you hear me a month from now or six months from now or two years from now, there may be a different story. Uh, the story will be the same about how I got here. But the story about where I am today, at least in my experience, will evolve and will continue to change, uh, as you would expect it to. If the steps and the, and the book are the integral part of this program, as they have come for me, I couldn't stand to be without the fellowship, but the design for living for me comes out of the book and the steps. And uh, the evolution continues to be a broadening uh, awakening of a spiritual awakening as the result of these steps. I grew up in a little town in western Kentucky named Mayfield, uh, about 12,000 Bible Belt of that part of, of the United States. Um, I grew up in a home where there was no alcohol and no drugs. Uh, my grandfather, my mother's father, died drinking bleach in the Mayfield City Jail. He was the town drunk. Uh, my mother was molested physically, emotionally, and sexually in that home. She was what we call an adult child of an alcoholic today. And if you have a problem with that terminology, then just read the front page or the first page of the family afterward. If you are around one of us, in essence, you get neurotic. Those were Wilson's words. You get neurotic. And now I adored my mother. I adored her when she was alive. She died in 1978 died as a relatively young woman, and I miss her more today than I ever have, and I loved her deeply, but my mother was goofy, and she should have been goofy because she never had a chance to deal with the shame, the rage, the resentments, all of the feelings that would go from having in, with having endured what she had to endure, and alcoholism dominated our home, although there was no alcohol in it. And the way it came out for me predominantly was conditional love. I learned rather quickly that the way to get mother's approval was to be perfect. Uh, now, Bill Wilson, and the second best thing that he ever wrote for me, the best thing that he ever wrote for me is the, is the big book, at least today. The second best thing he ever wrote was a letter that he wrote called Emotional Sobriety. And in that letter, he wrote that all of his problems came from money, power, prestige, sex, distilled into one word, approval. And he wrote that letter when he was 18 years sober in 1953. And I've listened to I don't know how many fist steps over the years and done I don't know how many fist steps over the years. And the, the pervading theme has been approval. I've held men in my lap big enough to eat that wall and stroke their back and stroke the back of their head while they cried with relief because I had told them it would be okay. A significant male telling them it would be okay. So I learned very early in life to be happy and to get approval was to be perfect. 
And when I got to Alcoholics Anonymous, it was the first place I'd ever gone where they told me, number one, I didn't have to be perfect. Number two, I couldn't be perfect. And number three, they were going to give me the rules and tools to deal with the fact that I couldn't be perfect. It was a great homecoming for me to get to a place that I didn't hear them say, you have to be perfect. But that was the first place I learned about conditional love, is I did everything Mother wanted me to do, and she lived vicariously through through me and through my younger brother. Uh, that was the way she gained credibility in this town where she always felt they saw her as the town drunk's daughter. And so... I found out I had to make A's, which I could do. I had the ability to do that, at least at that level. Uh, president of my classes, which I could do at that level. And when I did, Mother patted my butt, parted my hair, and made me king baby. That's where I developed most of the characteristics of my relationship with women. If you give them everything they want, then they'll take care of you and make you feel special. Well, you can imagine where all my relationships went. They went to hell in a handbasket because nobody, no, most women wouldn't buy that script. And the ones that did were just goofier than a goat. So we had a really good time <laughs> running around having a big time until they that peed me off or I peed them off, you know, whatever it was. But that's where I first learned about conditional love and perfection. The second place I learned about conditional love and perfection was the church. The two most dominant influences, at least that I've seen, and certainly in my life, the church and my home. Second place I learned about conditional love was in the church. Now, if you think I got a problem with the church, that's not true, because I had a string of medals for 12 years where I never missed Sunday school in church. Thank God I did, because in 1977, sitting there with a 12-gauge shotgun in my mouth right before I went into treatment, and been for the values that I learned in the church, you'd have a different speaker today. The back of my head would be on a wall somewhere. Because that's the only way I knew to get out of the pain. And those values I learned from the church held me in good stead. But they also taught me that if you, and, and when I came back from treatment, my next door neighbor was an Episcopal priest and my best friend. And I said, Jimmy, take me back to my church. And he said, I can do that, but you've got to go to AA because they have better success with alcoholics than we do. Now, I'd just gotten out of four months of treatment, so I knew that, but it really felt good to see a man with a collar saying that to me. And so, you know, I had a great relationship with the church. I ministered the chalice, the host was a lay reader on the vestry, the whole deal for eight and a half years. And then at eight and a half years, I sat with my priest, sat with my sponsor, and we prayed about where my ministry, we call it service, but where my ministry would be. Because I, you know, for me at least, what I know about Alcoholics Anonymous, each of us has a ministry. We may not choose to take it, but each of us has a ministry. And to carry that message, which I will develop through my recovery. And we decided, and I told him, I said, now I'll go to seminary. I sure as hell don't want to go to seminary, but if you want me to go to seminary, I'll go. And he said, no, with your experience, you need to be an Alcoholics Anonymous. So I had a great relationship with the church. But the church said to me, that it wasn't what I heard them say. It's what they said. You believe this or you go to hell. You believe this or you go to hell. Now, I was 12 years old, and I don't know how this will play in, in this audience, but it's the truth, and I'm not going for cheap humor. It was the truth. I was 12 years old. I was going to Sunday school listening to them to tell me that it's better to spill your seeds in the belly of a whore than on the ground. And I've just found, as a 12-year-old little boy, a new pull toy. And I have a real conflict of what's going to happen for me, you know, because I go through what little 12-year-old boys do. Then I go to church on Sunday. They have altar call, and I go down, and I, they baptize me again on Sunday night. Thank God, because that guilt was stacking up. That inability to be perfect was stacking up. So I learned conditional love in my home. I learned conditional love in church. Now, this didn't make me an alcoholic. I practiced medicine for, 35, for 25 years, family medicine. Then after that, I left in 1992, and for 16 years, I managed a program where we got doctors in the state of Kentucky into treatment for alcohol and drugs. We dealt with 1,500 doctors. During that time, we started a, a homeless shelter that sleeps 400 men and women a night to have 300 in a year-long program of recovery. About 20 years ago, I decided, no, I just, nah, I've been sober 31 years, and, and I was about 
God damn, time gets away. It was about 26 years ago. My sponsor said, I want you to learn all about alcoholism you can because I want you at some point in time to be changed the, the program in the medical schools here in the state. So I started studying addiction medicine, and I'm a specialist in addiction medicine. And I can put everything formula on the wall that tells you how we're different. The best textbook of medicine that's ever been written for alcoholism is the textbook of Alcoholics Anonymous. In 1938, he was telling us we had a progressive malady. He was telling us we were bodily and mentally different, that, that uh, we had a physical allergy and mental obsession, that, young, that women would drink differently from men, that young men, that young people would drink differently from old people. All this is in the textbook before anybody ever touched it. The 1990s has been called the decade of the brain. Because with better paradigms and better methodology, we know exactly today 99% of the difference in the alcoholic brain and the non-alcoholic brain. The alcoholic is playing a court low. That's not an excuse. It's well-documented science. So that's what makes me an alcoholic. I can't drink like a normal person. I have a long history to tell you I can't drink, but today I actually know why I can't drink. That's what makes me an alcoholic. It's because I'm bodily and mentally different. But let me tell you, when I came in the program, they said, if you stop the drinking and don't deal with the thinking, you go back to the drinking. And my thinking started way back then. My first conscious thought when I hit the delivery room floor was, damn, that's cold and this hurts. And from that time on, I've been scared. I've been resentful. I've hurt people. I have done weird things sexually. I have been dishonest and self-centered. And for those of you who are familiar with the book, those are the character defects. Those are the character defects. The best thing that Wilson wrote about this disease when he tried to explain it to us was a chapter more about alcoholism. And he talks about Jim's story. And in Jim's story, basically Jim failed to enlarge his spiritual life. And you say this to some young person, they say, well, he just didn't pray enough. He just didn't do this. Well, I'm not saying that isn't true. I'm sure it is true. But then he tells us exactly how Jim thinks. He said, this is the crux of the matter, is how Jim thought. Then he gives us Jim's story, and it's real classical. He didn't deal with his character defects. And I promise you, my daily living, if I deal with my character defects, I will be in good spiritual condition. If I start my morning, as I do, every day with the 11th step prayer, the 3rd step prayer, the 7th step prayer, live my day with the 10th step, which leads me to all the other steps, and close with the 11th step, I've dealt with my character defects because it outlines to me not only what they are but what I've got to do about them. And I stay in fit spiritual condition. That's just my story. I didn't do that from the time I walked in this program because for 10 years in this program, I went to seven meetings a week, never read the book, and never did the steps because I wasn't taught to, not because I was defiant. The marching order in Louisville, Kentucky at that time was don't drink, go to meetings, get a sponsor, tell him what's wrong with you. He'll tell you what to do and then go save a drunk. So, I mean, I was running around getting people in treatment time after time. I would Anything that happened to me, I'd tell my sponsor, and he'd tell me what to do, and I'd go do it. I became a lethal weapon for God. That's what I became because most of the people that I took off to treatment walked out. I mean, they didn't stay with me. There was a group of us that stayed together, and we were crazy because we didn't have that design for living. We just had a fellowship which was indescribably wonderful. But we didn't have that design for living. no. Big book's real clear. I deal with my character defects by enlarging my spiritual condition, and then I will deal with the thinking. But the old-timers were real clear to me. You stop the drinking, and you don't deal with the thinking. You go back to the drinking. And that's why the steps in the book are the absolute concrete way for me to deal with the thinking. Alcohol and drugs were no problem for me in high school. They were no problem for me in college. When I started medical school in 1958 at the University of Louisville, and this part of my story, now I'm a card-carrying, commode-hugging, 12-gauge shotgun in the mouth, two quarts of whiskey a night drunk. But there's a part of my story that has to do with drugs, and I've asked the World Service Office, I've asked all three of the sponsors I've had over 31 years, I've asked for the group conscience, and all I know is i got one story. 
I promise you I, I may be defiant about some things, but not this. I've got one story, and that story is what I've been given as I've come to know it that may be able to help somebody else out of the hell that we lived in with alcohol and drugs. And for 12 years, my story has to do with one drug, amphetamine, with no alcohol. The next eight years were alcohol with no other drug. Both of them beat me to death. They beat me to death. I have found clearly that for an alcoholic of my type, no mood-altering drug works in my brain like it does in a normal person. It just doesn't do it. And today, I can explain to you medically why if if you're not drinking and you think you can smoke a little dope, it ain't going to work. Not if you're an alcoholic of my type. If drinking's your problem and you think you can give up, or, or, or marijuana is your problem, or cocaine's your problem, you can give those up and think you can drink a little? No. If you think drinking was your problem, you think you can take some Valium, if you're an alcoholic of my type, and I don't know if you are, that's your choice, then it ain't going to work. Sooner or later. We used to treat alcoholics as though their problem was a Valium deficiency. And we would give them tons of Valium. Now, what happened is they quit drinking, and then we had to detox them from the Valium and get them into some sort of 12-step program. And my experience is going to show you, you know, I may be able, as, God, as, as my sponsor said, you may, you may impress a lot of people with what you know, but you'll help heal a lot of people with your experience. So I'm going to give you my experience with this. When I started medical school in 1958, I was terrified. I don't know many of us freshmen and medical students who weren't terrified. So I couldn't really focus on the gross anatomy, first year gross anatomy exam. And one of the upperclassmen came down and gave me this little capsule, said, take that, it'll help you stay awake and study. It was amphetamine. And I took that amphetamine, and for the first time in my life, the noise stopped. I didn't know the world was that loud until I took that amphetamine, and it's just as though the world got quiet. Within a month, I was taking it daily, and uh, two weeks before graduation, my senior year, in 1962, I got kicked out of medical school. In an amphetamine rage, I hit one of my professors. They thought that was bad form, so they got the dean, and they got me, and they got the head of the Department of Psychiatry, and we went down, and we sat in the dean's office, and he said, Burns, what's wrong with you? And I said, I take too many amphetamine. He said, do you believe that? And I said, yes, sir, I believe it. He said, then we're going to help you. And I said, what are you going to do? He said, we're going to put you in intensive psychiatric therapy. So I was out of medical school for almost two years. I saw two psychiatrists a week, one in Louisville and one in Nashville. At the end of almost two years, they both wrote me a ticket to get back in. I never took any drugs in that time. I didn't drink, as I told you, during that time. And I walked back into medical school ready to go. I'd reviewed all of my notes. I'd reviewed all of my, all of my books. I was ready to go, and grades hadn't been a problem. Walked back in the hospital that we were training in, and in less than an hour, I strung out on amphetamine again. And I just sat on the steps of the medical school and cried because I didn't know what was wrong with me. Now, those of you who are really good members of Alcoholics Anonymous, maybe some of you who are bad members of Alcoholics Anonymous, but you'll recognize what psychiatry didn't bring me. And I'm not anti-psychiatry. You're looking at somebody that's absolute uh, pro-therapy as long as the person doing the therapy knows what the hell they're doing with an alcoholic. And as long as the alcoholic fully understands that the solution doesn't come out of talking about the problem, it comes out of using the steps in the big book to deal with the problem. Now, that's not my admonition to you. That's my experience with me. Because I've had nine years of psychiatric therapy and been deacon in five churches. That was before I quit drinking two quarts of whiskey a night. So when I talk to you with the conviction that you may see me talk with you, please hear me. It's coming from experience. And I've also dealt with thousands of prisoners, thousands of street people, thousands of doctors, and go to five AA meetings a week and have been going to them for 31 years. So I've seen a lot of people, and I've made a lot of mistakes, and I've done a lot of things right. So it comes right out of the guts of experience. Psychiatry didn't bring me a spiritual solution. They brought me knowledge. And it's also what their contract says. Their contract isn't spiritual solution. Their contract is to bring me knowledge. They brought me a lot of good knowledge, which stood me in good stead when I got to y'all. But they didn't bring me the spiritual solution. 
And when I walked back into that hospital, what they also didn't know in 1964, 63, was what we today call cueing. Cocaine taught us a lot. You know, in the big book it says alcohol is subtle. Well, there's nothing subtle about cocaine. And in and, and the United States, basketball is a big sport, as you well know. And when you, somebody drives in, they lay the ball up there, and it goes through, and that's two points. And that's alcohol, and everybody politely claps. Here comes cocaine down from the other end, naked, basketball in both hands, screaming down the court, goes up and slam dunks them both, rips off the blackboard, backboard at still two points. But you never forget that cocaine is there because as it leaves, it's giving everybody the sign. Alcohol is subtle. There's nothing subtle about cocaine. And cocaine taught us about cueing. There's a place in the brain where everything we do is stored. And under certain conditions, it comes up. We know it as post-traumatic stress syndrome or Pavlov's uh, uh, syndrome. But I'll tell you, it's what we teach each other in recovery. Don't go back and or be sure and change playmates, playpens, and playthings. Because walking back into those positions, the bell will ring. The bell will ring. I've seen cocaine addicts cue off of a dollar bill if they snorted it. I've seen them cue off of a telephone ringing. Now, we didn't know that in 1963, so I walked through there, and the minute I walked back into that same environment with no spiritual solution, with no spiritual solution, it just became like that. I'm not cutting me loose. I'm just telling you that's what we know. With a spiritual solution, we can go anywhere. The book tells us that, doesn't it? If we're in fit spiritual condition. can go anywhere. And if we're not, it tells us to go work with a drunk repeatedly. I just wasn't there. We didn't know that that's where I had to be. My classmates enabled me that year. I graduated, went into my internship and residency, was interrupted because of the amphetamine four times, strapped down, IV fluids, straight jackets, padded cells. I might stay off of amphetamine six hours, six days, six weeks, six months. Always went back and psychotic. Uh, the Vietnam War was raging when I got out of my residency, started my office, and I was on amphetamine, and I was really angry at the Vietnam War. I thought we need to win it or get out. And I was in the doctor's lounge letting everybody know how I felt. And one of my good friends said, well, by God, if that's the way you feel, just join the Army. I thought, that sounds like a good idea. So I went down and joined the Army. Didn't tell my office staff, didn't tell my wife, just went and joined the Army. I came, you know, some of the psychiatrists I've had since said I had an impulse disorder. <laughs> you show me a drunk without an impulse disorder, and I'll show you somebody that ain't trying, you know. So I go in the Army. I almost get court-martialed and put in, and the uh, post commander came in and said, are you taking the amphetamine? Yes, sir. He said, if you don't quit, I'll have to court-martial you. So I quit. Once he explained it to me, I quit. You know, I was able. But I've dealt with a lot of drug addicts, and most drug addicts, and I'm not going to tell you everybody can, but most drug addicts can quit if the consequences are bad enough. And certainly I could. But there came a time in my drinking where I could not quit drinking. It wasn't possible. I couldn't quit. The consequences made no difference. Losing Casey, losing my license, nothing mattered. I couldn't quit drinking. But I quit the amphetamine, came home, got started on it again in 1969, opened my practice, had a gallbladder attack. Uh, they took my gallbladder out. The surgeon and I, who were good friends, the internist who and I were good friends, and we sat in that hospital and held hands and prayed that I'd quit taking amphetamine. That was my last amphetamine in 1969. Then I started drinking. First four years of my drinking wasn't alcoholic. I didn't sit out to get drunk. I didn't sit out to stay sober. I never thought about it. I drank a lot. I got drunk a lot, but I never thought about it one way or another. It didn't interfere with my job. didn't interfere with anything. The next three years of my drinking was alcoholic because when I got up at 7 o'clock in the morning, I knew at 4.30 that afternoon I'd have my first drink. I didn't drink as much. I didn't get drunk as often, but every morning I got up and throughout the day, 
I was waiting for the drink that would happen at 4.30. I would come into the office early. I would see my patients. I would see the emergency patients because when I left at 4 o'clock, my partner took over and saw any other patients because I was walking out at 4 o'clock, walking across to the 7-Eleven uh, grocery store, getting me a quart of beer, drinking it, driving 25 miles home, got in there and got my scotch and water and got smooth. Y'all remember smooth? Hell yes, you remember smooth. That's what you're in this room for because you can't forget smooth, you know. So there will come a day and we'll be unable to bring into our conscious memory with sufficient force the humiliation of a week or a month ago. We are powerless. That memory of smooth peace, quiet. The last year my drinking was addictive. I drank a quart and then two quarts of whiskey a night. told myself I wasn't an alcoholic because I never drank in my office. And had to believe it. My first wife kicked me out of the house in 1975. She should have kicked me out sooner. That marriage was born in hell. She was a mean-spirited woman, and I was a crazy guy. She didn't get a bar- bargain, and neither did I. Let me tell you why we got married. We got married because she was the first woman I ever slept with, and I was the first man she ever slept with, and our religion said if you sleep with each other, you have to get married. We didn't want to sleep together. We, I mean... We really didn't want to do that. But we sure as hell didn't want to get married. But we did. And we lived through 17 years of of trouble. Finally, I drank enough whiskey that she embarrassed her enough. She kicked me out. And I was so happy. She kicked me out. And I womanized and got me a Corvette and a light blue leisure suit. (laughs) You've seen those leisure suits. I mean, I was was a thing of beauty. And I always... (laughs) And I carried with me a quart of Chevis Regal Scotch in the trunk of my car, my white Corvette, and a sterling silver mint julep cup. And when when I got there with my quart of whiskey and a mint julep cup, the party could start. I mean, it didn't matter whether anybody else was there. The party was going to start because I was there, and that's the way it was. And I did everything that, that was that I knew to do, but whiskey had blown off my cortex. So I womanized. I just I did all the things that I really wanted to do. And uh, in that period of time, I met Casey. And uh, if you get a chance today, and I'm sorry I didn't introduce her, Casey, would you stand up? This is my wife, and I really apologize. <laughs> and and as you can see, Casey is a beautiful woman, and and uh, when I met her, she was a beautiful girl. And. Uh, and I knew she was the right one. Now, her daddy was bipolar, and she watched her mother take care of her daddy. My mother was goofy, and I watched my daddy take care of my mother. So our pathology brought us together. Uh, our, hearts, our hearts have kept us together. That's exact, And recovery has kept us together. We started with no scars, and by the time we were 13 years sober, we had scars all over us because we brought the disease in with us. We brought the disease in with us with virtually no game plan for living, and I'll describe what I mean by that. But we, but most alcoholics do, we had one date and then moved in with each other, and uh, it seemed like the thing to do at the time. And uh, it was the thing to do, basically, two little children taking care of each other, walking hand in hand through the dark and, and, and the cold. That's exactly what it was. And uh, we drank together drink for drink. Casey's 13 years younger than I am, and she didn't get sick, and I did. And I, oh, she's 14 years younger than me. I'm sorry. When did that happen? <laughs> you didn't have a birthday, and I did, right? I, I understand. Okay. And uh, so she, I didn't. She got. She didn't get sick, and I did. And going into that last day, uh, the last end of that drinking, I'll, I'll describe it to you. And I can start any time during the day, but I usually start at 11 o'clock in the morning. That's when I get. That's when I would get up. Now I didn't go to bed. I slept in a chair. And Casey would come in every night crying and say, "Please get up and come to bed with me." And I'd say, "No, I'm crazy, and I'll drive you crazy." I'm just crazy, and I'll drive you crazy. And she would cry and go to bed. And then I would just lay in that chair, and I kept thinking, if I don't go to sleep, I won't wake up. And if I don't wake up, then the day won't start. And if the day doesn't start, then I won't have all this hell to start over again. That was the delusion. I'd reached that point of delusion. I mean, complete irrational type of thinking. 
I'd get up at 11, I would take my take a Valium to stop shaking because I was really going into DTs pretty much all the time, race to the office, take about two to three hours to see what I normally saw in eight hours, then race over to the hospital and see my patients and then come home and I'd call Casey and she would fix the scotch and water and put it in the refrigerator because refrigerator, I had it timed just exactly right where it would just be chilled. Then I'd walk in, I'd take out that, drink that first drink. She'd fix my broil steak and baked potato because I was a doctor, and I knew I was destroying my liver, so I had to eat. You know, I, I never even considered stopping drinking, but I was going to keep eating, you understand? And, uh, I mean, that's just the way it was. And then I would sit down on the floor with my bottle of scotch whiskey, and my first record of the evening was the Mormon Tabernacle Choir and the Philadelphia Philharmonic Orchestra doing the battle hymn of the Republic. You know, my eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. And I just cry and cry. Then I'd put on my next record, which was Neil Diamond's I Am, I said, you know. This, and this is where he's talking to a chair. And I'd put it on. My hero at this time was a man who was talking to a chair. Now... Neil Diamond had a lot of problems in the 70s, but he wrote this magnificent song, and if you ever listen to it, it says, I've got an emptiness deep inside, it won't let me go, but I, I've got an emptiness deep inside, and it won't let me go. I'm not a man who liked to swear, but I never cared for the sound of being alone. And any alcoholic who's reached the point of surrender really can relate to that. You know, I could be alone in a crowd of 60,000 people. I could be alone anywhere. I was always alone. And I'd just cry and I'd cry and I'd cry and I'd cry and then I'd get in that chair and we'd go through it night after night after night after night. And one morning she'd gone to work and I got up and I knew it was over. I mean, I knew it was over. I didn't have a clue what to do about it because like I told you, I'd had nine years of psychiatric therapy, been deacon in five churches, and I was drinking two quarts of whiskey a night. But I knew it was over. And I said, God, you got to help me. And I knew immediately what I had to do. And I walked back into my bedroom, got my 12-gauge shotgun, and put it in my mouth. And I was out of here. Now, I really believed in God. I mean, this is my story, and this is my journey. I really believed in God. Had throughout the whole time. God lived on a cloud and looked like Charlton Heston or Santa Claus. And when I pulled that trigger, I'd go up on that cloud. I'd be home. The pain would stop. And then that would be it. What I didn't know how to do was how to bring that power that I loved so much into me. This God was a God that lived here. I lived here and never the twain would meet till I died and then I'd go home. But there was no way to bring that power into me that I knew. And you know, the book is real clear. Step two, lack of power. Isn't that what it says? Lack of power, that's our dilemma. What the book and what the steps and what the program has done for me is bring that power realistically into me. That's what the whole deal's about. I didn't recognize that for probably 25 years, even after I got into the steps. It was still, I did all this in God's name, but I did it with Burns Brady's power. And finally, along came enough for me to realize every, everything I'm doing, this talk today, is with God's power. I may not articulate it the way he would want it to be done, but I'm real clear that I wouldn't even be... Sta I wouldn't even... <laughs> and don't you forget it either. <laughs> <laughs> if you think this is bad, wait till the next one comes through. <laughs> is with God's power. I mean, it, th that's the whole essence of the deal. And I sat right there on the bed and I said, God, if you don't want me to do this, show me a reason not to do it. I thought, Casey will be better off without me. My, my parents will be better off without me. Uh, my patients will be better off without me. And I got to my children. Now, I was not a Norman Rockwell father. I wanted to be, but I wasn't even close. I wasn't even close. I tried. I just wasn't close. But I knew one thing. I loved them desperately. They were about 11 and 6. Now, my daughter's now been in AA 28 years. My son's been in AA for, she's 48, been in AA 28 years. And, and uh, my, my son's been in for 22 years. I mean, both, neither of them had a chance 
from the gene pool they came from. They just didn't have a chance in the house they grew up in. But I knew those babies. I'd been in, I'd been in practice about eight years, and I'd seen people come in impaled on what had they done wrong, that daddy shot himself, mama shot herself, wife did, husband did, children did. Why didn't I love them enough? Why didn't they love me enough? The whole deal. And I treated a lot of adults who never could let go of that. And I thought, if I pull this trigger, those babies may never come out of it. Now, let me tell you the significance that I've come to know about that story. I asked God to give me a reason not to pull the trigger. And it was years before I saw this, this spiritual experience. I had a spiritual awakening as the result of these steps, and then I saw the spiritual experience. This is my story. The spiritual experience is that I asked God to give me a reason not to do it, and he showed me another human being. He showed me another human being. It was years before I read in the book, in the 8th and ninth step, our primary purpose, our primary purpose is to fit ourselves to be of maximum service to God and our fellow man. In the family afterward, Bill writes something that just absolutely chills me. Those of us who have spent much time in the world of spiritual make-believe have recognized the childishness of it. This has been replaced by a great sense of purpose. God wants us to have our head in the clouds with him, but our feet must be firmly planted on earth. That's where our fellow travelers are. That's where our work will be done. He writes in another place talking about basically doing a 12-step call on a preacher. And he said, your preacher may know about, more about the book than you do, but he's curious as to why you're sober and he's not. He said he may be an example. Listen to this. He may be an example that faith alone is insufficient. It must be followed by self-sacrifice and unselfish constructive action. Self-sacrifice, steps one through three. Unselfish constructive action, steps four through twelve. Our primary purpose is to fit ourselves to be a maximum service to God and our fellow man. It doesn't say to be service, to fit ourselves to be of maximum service. To fit. What a joy to know what I'm here for. What a joy no longer to have to wonder what my job is. What a joy to know what my place in Alcoholics Anonymous is and what the marching orders are to fulfill it. Great day in my life. Great day in my life. I laid the shotgun down, got in touch with a psychiatrist the next morning, and the first guy of my understanding was five nine, wore glasses and stuttered. And I said, David, tell me what to do. I'll do anything you tell me to do. I'll do anything. I lived about eight years, about... Eight months of incredible humility where I surrendered to a higher power at every level. By not getting in the book, I never saw how that would grow up. So I became a little boy for 10 years in recovery. Psychiatrist sent me. The man who ran the treatment program told me what to do. I got home. I got a sponsor. He told me what to do. And that's the way it was for 10 years. That's the way it was for 10 years. When I got home from treatment, uh, well, they sent me off, detoxed me in New York, flew me down to Atlanta, and uh, I was there for almost four months, and I came home. When I got back to Louisville, it was the best of times and the worst of times for AA. It was the best of times because the fellowship was indescribably wonderful. I mean, we ran together. There were five of us, and I called us the little pygmy elephants, one right behind the other holding each other's tail. It wasn't this come 30 minutes early and stay 30 minutes late. Oh, no. We lived with our wives 24-7. We'd call each other six and seven times a day. Our wives would get together, and we'd get together on weekends and cook out. 
I mean, three of those men are now dead, and the other two of us are walking on banana peels. But I got to tell you, I revere them, and they revered me, and, and, and the whole deal was wonderful. That was a wonderful time because nobody had published at that time about the post-acute withdrawal syndrome. Bill Wilson was the first person to ever describe it. Remember when he said for a year and a half he couldn't get a job because he was racked with waves of self-pity and resentment? He was the first person to ever describe what medical science described in 1979. For six months to two years, anagrade memory may be distorted. If you've ever gone to an AA meeting and walked out and couldn't find your car, welcome. <laughs> you know? Or, I mean, repeatedly. I didn't say, it says anagrade, so I could remember how to practice medicine because that's like riding a bicycle, but I couldn't read any new material. And in working in the he homeless shelter and in the prisons, these men just light up when I say, look, how do you feel? I can't remember anything. Don't worry about it. You know where you are? Yeah, I'm in prison. Good. You got that part right? You're just fine. You're going to wake up one day and you're going to be out of prison. I would go in. I would see a psychiatrist on Tuesday and Thursday. And when I'd go in on Thursday, Homer would say, where do you want to start? I'd say, Homer, where do you want to start? And he'd say, let's go back to where we were on Tuesday. And I said, I don't remember where we were. You're blocking your therapy. Oh, God, I'm blocking my therapy. I'm a piece of dung. I mean, this whole thing's never going to work. I'd go into the AA meeting in the old time. say, you got a problem? I got a problem. What's the problem? I'm blocking my therapy. And they'd say, I'd tell them the story. And they'd say, do you remember where his office is? And I'd say, yeah. And they'd say, that's as good as it's going to get for about two years. And that's why we learn to treat people in recovery, not, not trying to feed them steak when the best they can process is mashed potatoes. Look at the difference between the big book and the 12 and 12. Wilson wrote the big book with three years of sobriety. It is crisp. It is simple. Anybody that's got the IQ of a mountain goat can get the big book if they want it. 12 and 12 is slicker. I'm not saying it's a bad book. That's not my point. But watch the difference in where he's come in that period of time. He's using better sentence structure. He's using a different kind of language. He still has the same thought content. But you see the recovery. The first six months to two or three years can be really, they can be amazingly difficult. Simple problem solving and stress management. Sleep patterns. What you got is a midbrain animal on an adult's body. And I used to go to work, and I was fine between examining rooms, but I'd sometimes stop in the middle of the hall and just start shaking and crying and go into my inner office, and I'd call my spotter, and I'd say, Jim, I'm flying apart. And he'd say, did you get up on time? Yeah. Did you do your meditation? Yeah. Did you eat your breakfast? Yeah. Did you get the office on time? Yeah. You're going to eat your lunch? Yeah. You come to the meeting night? Yeah. You'll be okay. Thanks, Jim. Felt better. Forty-five minutes to an hour later, Jim, I'm flying apart. Did you get up on time? Yeah. Did you do your meditations? Yeah. Same drill. I mean, it's not written down anywhere, but it's exactly what I did. And I stayed sane because of that beautiful fellowship. I got crazy because the worst of times in AA was I've told you how we did it in the middle 70s, late 60s and the middle 70s. So for 10 years, this man ran my life. At 10 years in recovery, I did some very selfish, self-centered things. And I told my sponsor what I'd done, and he called Casey and told her. Somebody says, oh, my God, why did you do that? That's not the issue. The issue is what did I do about it? First of all, I said, I can't be around you anymore because you, you have raped me. And if I told you what went on, you'd say, yeah. So I said, God, you got to help me. And about that time, a little sponsee of mine came up with eight tapes. They were Joe and Charlie's tapes of the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. And as I listened to those tapes, I heard the full 12-step program. I'd lived my life with a three-step program, a three and a third. The first three steps, which were mine with that shotgun in my mouth, they were not that complicated. They were mine. God gave them to me right then, or they certainly were mine. They certainly were mine. Since then, I've lived my life with a 12-step program. And I asked God, he said, tell him about it. You want to live a three-step program? I did for 10 years. You want to live a 12-step program? I have for 21 years. The difference is daylight and dark. The difference is daylight and dark. Spiritual answer and program of action.
That's my experience. That's my experience. Uh, I got into the book. Casey w- came into Al Anon when, uh, when I went into AA. After six years in Al Anon, she heard her AA story, came into AA. Casey went back to uh, school, pissed me off. And, uh, I mean, it really did. I mean, I said, I'm really grateful you're going to school. Well, the first time I came home and the lights weren't on and my meals wasn't cooked, I wasn't a happy camper. And I made life for her really miserable, and our life got really miserable. Consequently, we put a bunch of scars in a relationship which really didn't have any. Casey had had become my indentured servant. I was her benevolent dictator. I put her right on my hip, and every, every season change, I sent her a whole new wardrobe. Never asked her what she wanted, just sent them to her. At least every two years, I sent her a new car. Never asked her what kind of car she wanted. At least three or four times a year, we went on these great vacations. Never asked her where she wanted to go. You know, I became Santa Claus, the tooth fairy, and the Easter bunny, all wrapped into one conglomerate. And I thought that was the way you're supposed to do. You teach, you just put them on a little pedestal and then do things for them. And when she went to school, man, I tell you what, it flew all over me. And all the chaos came after that. Because I didn't know how to deal with my resentments. I didn't know how to deal with my fears. I didn't know how to deal with my harms to others. I didn't know how to deal with my sex conduct. I did not know anything except try to be a good little boy. No design for living as written in our textbook. For a drunk like me, there is no other way to live. Bill Wilson said, It's the common property of all mankind. We have nothing, nothing that didn't come from somewhere else. Faith without works is dead. When Bill and Bob first got together, I asked Smitty, Bob's son, I said, I knew Smitty for about five years. He's dead now. And I said, tell me what happened when Bob and Bill were together. He said, Burns, I would come down the steps, and here would be Daddy propped up against a chair, and, my, and Bill propped up against the chair of the dining room table, and Mom would be sitting at the table reading from the Bible, reading from the book of James. And Paul's letter to the Corinthians on love. And the book of James is where he lifted it out. Faith without works is dead. One, two, three, four through nine. Faith without works is dead. And that's where we were. Uh, at 13, 14, 15 years of recovery, uh, she had a very strong 12-step program, and so did I. We went into therapy for those three years. And we told the therapist that uh, the only solution we knew was a 12-step solution, but we didn't know where the bullets were coming from. And we spent three years of very hectic, God-directed therapy where we solved everything we learned with a 12-step solution, having had a spiritual awakening as a result of these steps. What I learned during that time is the answer to everything is a spiritual answer, having had a spiritual awakening as the result of these steps. What I also learned is that that program is a process. When people say, you have to accept something. And Paul Oliver wrote that in Alcoholic Doctor Addict. And I sat down with Paul. He was a good friend. And I said, Paul, I just really hate that piece of the book. And he said, why? And I said, I just don't get it. I said, I've sat in AA meetings and somebody comes in and said, my wife's been raped, my children have been kidnapped, my ru- cattle's been rustled, my barns have been wern- burned, my fields are, in, are, are burning, and somebody will say, you just have to accept it. And I feel like, Skew, you just have to accept it. Give me a break. Well, they're right. But how does that acceptance come? What I've come to know, it comes as the result of these steps, this process. I can't will acceptance, serenity, love, sobriety. I can't will any of that, but I can get it through as the result of these steps. That's the spiritual awakening for me. Uh, about eight years ago, I, I got into a quandary. I couldn't, I knew I was happy, joyous, and free, and I knew everything seemed to be fine, but but I couldn't figure out why that uh, that I didn't know peace. Now, if you'd asked me how to define peace, I couldn't have done it. 
but I thought it was it was like stop the motor, like that first drink when we could drink and the pe you know the motor stopped. I thought that must be peace, and I don't feel that. So I went to see the psychiatrist with a therapist that was over there and good friends of mine, and they said, you know, nobody works a better program than you do, but we don't know what to tell you. Just keep doing it, I guess. So I sat down and I asked God, I said, God, help me. Where, where, where do you think this answer would come from? Do I just keep doing what I'm doing and maybe it'll be revealed? And I felt him say, no, nah, study Bill Wilson. Here's a crazy guy. Study Bill Wilson. You know, when you look at the Old Testament, all the great leaders were very wounded. Moses, David, Judah, uh, you go right through them all. Elijah, Elisha, all of them were wounded people. So it appeared that God picked wounded people. Now, I don't know if that's true. It just appeared to me that he did, certainly in the Old Testament. And here he picks Bill Wilson, and Bill Wilson is so wounded that it's almost incredible. His strength and his purpose comes at least for me through his woundedness, as I think so does mine. And as I believe for y'all, so does y'all's, depending on how you want to use it. That's what my opinion is. So I began to study Bill Wilson, and I found what I was looking for. In 1940, there was a Roman priest, a Jesuit, named Ed Dowling. And Ed Dowling read the big book in 1940 and realized that this man who had written it had reduced all the Ignatian spiritual exercises into 12 steps. And he made a special trip to New York to meet Bill Wilson. He said, I have to see the man who wrote this. And it was in November, and it was a cold night. Nobody knows where Lois was, but they were on their 24th Street, in the 24th Street clubhouse, and the caretaker was downstairs. He got his room to keep the place clean. Bill's upstairs in his hypochondriacal mood. Bill was a complete conversion hysteric. So am I. I mean, as a doctor, my differential diagnosis for athletes' feet starts off with Sutsugamuchi fever, and then it goes, gets worse from there. I mean, I'm a complete hypochondriac, and, and I've got the tools to do it. Hell, Wilson just kind of played around with it, you know. But he's laying up there, and he thinks he's dying from a bleeding ulcer. He had a bleeding ulcer about three times a day, but he was always doing that stuff, you know. I mean, I love this man. I adore him, but part of the reason I adore him is he was such a flake. I mean, he was he was just such a flake. And he's sitting up there thinking he's dying from his ulcer. And, uh, and about 10 o'clock at night, the caretaker comes up and said, Bill, there's somebody here to see you. And he says, oh, no, not another drunk. Have you ever been on your third day of doing somebody's fifth step? You think, if I have to listen to this crap one more day, I'm going to puke. But you do it because, you know, that's what you do. So, <laughs> so. Up, he says, okay, send him up. So here comes Dowling. He's about five, six, shocky white hair, pugsy face, arthritis in his spine, uses a cane. Wilson can hear him tapping down the hall. He comes into the room, five, six, about six, four, six, three, or six, four. Dowling has his overcoat on. Wilson says, take your coat off and let's talk. When he took off his coat, he saw his collar. Now, Wilson revered men of the cloth. And I'm absolutely certain in all probability it's because he thought they had something he didn't have. And I've studied most of the letters that Wilson and Dowling wrote over the next 20 years because from 1940 to 1960, their relationship was incredible. Hadn't been for Dowling, I'm not sure what would have happened to Wilson. I'm not sure exactly what would have happened to A.A. because he took Wilson through some really rough spots during that time with, with his demeanor and just his attitude and the way he was that he used his spirituality, and his religion. So Wilson just fell in love with people of the cloth. So they sat down and started talking, and they talked for four or five hours and just fell in love with each other. And in the middle of that conversation, or sometime during that conversation, Wilson says to Dowling, will I ever know peace? Dowling says, no. He says, why? He said, you've been blessed with divine dissatisfaction. <laughs> he says, you're searching will bring so many people home. That is your blessing. That is your blessing. And as I read that, I just burst into tears. All of a sudden, I knew what we'd been teaching each other. To carry out this message that I've been given has been my blessing. And with it, I have done things that I never thought I could ever do in a way that I never thought that I could do them. That I ever thought that I could do them. What I do know is when I'm in those prisons, when I'm in that homeless shelter, when I'm sitting talking to a drunk one-on-one, -on -one, and 
I see their light, eyes light up, and I know at that moment they know that I know that they know. I feel absolute exquisite peace. Somebody said one time, you run all the time. What are you running from? I said, I know today I'm not running from anything. I'm running to something. I'm running to something. There's a joy out there, and I want to be in the middle of it. The last story is my daddy. At that 14 years of sobriety, Casey and I were coming home. We literally were coming home in our spirituality, in our relationship, in our peace, the whole thing. Daddy, Mama, I made my amends to Mama when she died in 78, and she hugged me, and Casey and I, she died of cancer, and for eight months I'd been sober, and I took Casey down every weekend, and she and Mother just fell in love with each other. I made all my amends, and Mother just hugged me and said, Thank God. And then I'd try to make them Daddy. My Daddy is one of the most beautiful men I've ever known, a very gentle giant. I never heard him raise his voice, but he would just appear. I was in trouble. There'd be daddy to take care of me. That was just daddy. I adored him. And I would try to make my amends, and daddy would say, Burns Mac, please, I don't want to talk about it. When daddy died, daddy died. Daddy married about eight months after mama died to a woman that was a gift of God to us, a good friend of his and mother's. And when daddy died, Peggy told me that daddy wouldn't listen to my amends because he was too ashamed. And I said, of me? And she said, no. Your daddy was ashamed of himself. He thought he'd cause alcoholism. So when I would try to talk to daddy and he wouldn't talk, and I wanted daddy so much from what I was talking about earlier. He burns Mac, it's okay. Burns Mac, it's okay. Then he went into Alzheimer's. He actually had microinfarct dementia, but it looked like Alzheimer's for about the last five years of his life. And I'd just go down, and he got to where he didn't know me. He didn't know who mother had ever been. He didn't even know Peggy. He didn't know my brother. So I'd drive down every weekend to, to work with Daddy, and on the way down, I'd say, God, take away my pain. And I'd about a 250-mile drive one way, and I'd pull up and go into the nursing home where we'd put him because it's, he needed health care. And it wouldn't work, and I'd cry all the way back home. Next weekend, I'd go down. Finally, this one weekend, the therapy, the steps, the fel- the whole deal. And I pulled up next to, to the nursing home and just said, God, let me be for my daddy what you want me to be. I don't even remember saying it different. I just remember saying that. I walked in. Daddy was in a wheelchair. He, I, I didn't call him daddy. That confused him. I said, how can I help you? And he thought I was Uncle Buster. He said, yeah, would you shave me? So I shaved Daddy, and I said, would you like some lunch? He said, please. I rolled him out there, and I fed him because he's just about too weak to feed himself. And then Peggy came in and sat down, my stepmother, and she and I got to talking, and Daddy was just watching us. I turned around and said, would you like to go out on the porch? He said, I believe I would, Buster. And I rolled him out there, and Peggy came back. We were sitting there talking to each other, Peggy and I, and Daddy just watching. He raised up in his wheelchair, and he looked at me. He said, son, today you're just like the little boy your mother and I raised. I love you very much. Thank you for coming to see me. Now, two second, ten seconds later, he didn't know who I was. Never did again. We buried him in 1992. There was a real miracle that happened that day. The miracle wasn't that my daddy recognized me. Not to me. As a physician, I can explain most of that. The real miracle and the fact that I can explain it makes it even more of a miracle is that this self-centered alcoholic, this fear-ridden, resentment-ridden alcoholic said that day, based on what you taught me and what I read and studied and learned, is let me be for my daddy what you want me to be. That's Alcoholics Anonymous, as I've come to know it and as I live it. What a great privilege to be over here talking with you all today, and I appreciate the honor of letting me. I love you very much. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.